Hello and welcome to, depending on how you want to define it, either the <laughs> second May edition of .edu Live or the early June edition of .edu Live, uh, AC's monthly policy discussion. Uh, I am your host, John Pansmith, and joining me today is my wonderful co-host, Sarah Spreitzer, and in addition, a new and very special guest to .edu Live, Emmanuel Guillory. Hi, Emmanuel. Hello. And, I'm so happy to have Emmanuel joining us, John. So it's it's not just me talking to you. This is let great. Me let me guarantee you, Sarah, you are not nearly as happy as I am to have Emmanuel <laughs> only joining us on .edu Live, but joining us at ACE because Emmanuel is ACE's newest government relations member. You've been here just less than a month, Emmanuel. Uh, any any inside scoops you want to share with people who are watching this about what it's like to work at ACE? <laughs> Well, I would say the inside scoops is that I work with amazing colleagues and everyone is very friendly and very welcoming. So I consider myself very fortunate to be a part of the ACE team. So, well, I oh, promise thanks, the people Emmanuel. listening, we that's didn't true, set though. that up so he could say <laughs> that. That's that. I think that's genuine. I hope it's genuine, but you are talking to those actual colleagues. So, you know, I, a little bit of skepticism. You're that sincere about working with us. I know what it's like to work with us. So, you know, give it time. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Emmanuel is new at AC. He is a senior director of government relations with us. Uh, one of the reasons I mentioned I'm so excited about him joining us is he is taking over what was my old portfolio, a portfolio I love that really touches on a lot of uh, big and important issues to our members, particularly around student financial aid, both funding and policy, accountability, oversight, uh, a lot of things in a regulatory space, especially around HEA reauthorization and, and regulations coming out of HEA. So a big portfolio, somebody that I think you'll all get to know very well uh, as we move forward. And a lot of you may know Emmanuel already from time at NICU, which is where he came to AC from, uh, and previously before that at UNCF and then on the Hill on the Education Workforce Committee. So well-traveled uh, and and well-experienced and uh, just a great colleague and a great uh, person to have working with us. So we know you like working with Emmanuel just as much as we do. But we have a few things to dig into. This is a pretty substantive slate of things to talk about. And one of them, Emmanuel, we're going to come back to you and talk a little bit about gainful employment in just a second. Uh, but before we do that, probably the big news of this week uh, really, the big news here in Washington, not just in higher ed, is the debt ceiling uh, deal. And we are moving through that process for people who have not been tracking it. Over the weekend, the president and Speaker McCarthy reached agreement on the parameters of a budget deal. Uh, that deal was uh, moved through the House Rules Committee yesterday, a divided vote, both Republicans and Democrats actually voting in opposition to it, but it did clear the Rules Committee. Uh, it is moving to the floor on a relatively aggressive schedule, in part because uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen has said that the debt ceiling, we will hit it officially on June 5th. So they have until Monday to do something. So moving forward aggressively, the deal itself is pretty interesting, right? I mean, I, I think you both would agree with me that it's an interesting yeah. deal. Um, publicly, it's been announced as a six-year spending limits deal. It would fund, it would raise the debt ceiling. Uh, into January of 2025, getting you past the, yes, 2025. Yeah. I saw the quizzical looks, we were all checking to make sure we had the dates right. January <laughs> of 2025, uh, moving this past the next election cycle so that whatever uh, debt ceiling issues we have will not impact the next election. Uh, when we talk about it being a six-year deal, functionally, it's really just a two-year deal. Uh, there are spending caps, hard spending caps, and forcible spending caps in place for the next two years. After that, there are still spending caps for those subsequent four years, but they're not enforceable. So functionally, they're not much of a limitation on Congress. Uh, those caps, not as dramatic as Republicans had hoped for and put forward in the Limit, Save, and Grow Act that they had passed through the House, uh, but still substantive cuts in terms of overall growth and spending. The uh, Department of Defense spending for this year, the approaching fiscal year, which is fiscal year 24, uh, is still allowed to grow, as is uh, VA healthcare, but everything else is capped at FY23 levels. Uh, so essentially flat funding for everything outside of Department of Defense and VA healthcare. Uh, for fiscal year 25, there will be uh, some growth in spending, but it's only 1%. So not a substantial amount, significantly lower than the average of what spending increases by Congress. And, and certainly given the inflationary environment we're in, 
uh, both flat funding and a 1% increase well, well below, uh, in many cases, what we think is needed for the programs we care about. But uh, John, also, yeah, that, I, I was just going to say that 1% growth is really far from where they started, right? Because I think when we they started the negotiations, they were talking about deep across the board cuts. And so even allowing for 1% growth seems to be hopeful, at least, um, that we're not, we're not facing like across the board 30% cuts or something to uh, non-defense discretionary. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. And I think you can look at this in two different ways, right? The president came into these negotiations saying, pass a clean debt zone limit, no, no caps on spending whatsoever. House Republicans, uh, you know, laid out their plan in the Limit, Save and Grow Act, which would have cut current year funding back to FY22 levels, kept all of that on the non-defense side. So really $130 billion cut to non-defense spending. It's about a 30% cut in funding across those areas. So massive cuts. I mean, you went... <laughs> as much as negotiations do. They started with one side saying no cuts, one side saying massive cuts. And what we got were functionally not cuts, but significant limitations on the growth of federal spending. I think, uh, and if either of you know the exact number, I think it's about like 2.1 or 2.5 trillion in savings the CBO scored this as. Uh, I, I haven't seen the score yet. I, I did actually read through it though. And when you were talking about a clean debt ceiling act, you know, it's only 99 pages, which for some of these bills, I mean, they can be massive. So uh, to me, it seemed fairly clean. Yeah, it's 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 as much as the attention it's getting and as much as we are talking about the provisions, it's a relatively short and simple bill. And it does give both sides a lot of what they were looking for. I think there's, you know, Always in Washington, D.C., people are looking for winners and losers, and you can look at different pieces of this, different components. There's a lot of things in there that uh, are specific to certain industries. There's things about permitting that weren't included that a lot of people, both Democrats and Republicans, had hoped to see. Things around environmental regulations, lots of little things. But the big picture things are relatively straightforward. These are, you know, they reached agreement on these top, top level caps uh, and are moving forward on, you know, a handful of other provisions. Some of those other savings they identified, though, uh, are, res are rescissions to existing COVID relief funds. Um, and there's about $30 billion in savings as a result of that. Uh, now, I have had a number of questions from presidents. I don't know if either of you have as well about, I still have some remaining HER funds. Does mm -hmm. that mean I will have to give those funds back? And the short answer is no. Uh, the rescissions are to unobligated funds. Uh, the government essentially counts unobligated funds as those that haven't been assigned out. Uh, so if you received uh, funding through the government, through the HERF program, uh, even if you have not spent that money yet, that money is obligated. They will not be asking for that back. The White House released a chart that says uh, essentially there's $361 million in rescissions that will come from the Education Stabilization Fund. That's the big pool of money that both K-12 and higher ed was provided through the COVID relief uh, funding across those three bills. 361 million is about, uh, well, it's it's rel very small relative to the 257 billion in overall funding through those programs uh, between K-12 and higher ed. So it's not clear exactly where that money will come from, but to be clear, if you have unspent her funds, one, you should probably figure out exactly what you're doing with those two, because time is running out. Uh, mm -hmm. June 30th is the deadline. Uh, but two, more importantly, the government will not be asking you to send those back. Those will not be impacted by this deal. And John, I'll just hop in here and quickly say that depending on what sources you're looking at, it could be upwards to 400, um, 402 million actually being rescinded. Um, so just wanted oh, to. Great. Well, not great, but thanks for the. I mean, but, <laughs> depending <laughs> on you know, three hundred and sixty or three hundred and ninety-two or four hundred and two, so just somewhere in that ballpark. Great. Um, <laughs> the other thing specific to higher ed in this bill, and and this, you know, good example again of what we're talking about: compromise. Republicans mm -hmm. in Limit Save and Grow had asked for uh, immediately resuming repayment of federal student loans. Uh, terminating the Biden, uh, the loan forgiveness proposal, as well as putting further caps around limits on the Department of Education from doing anything in the student loan space that would cost taxpayers additional money. The final deal included 
Uh, in part, one of those, uh, it would require the Department of Education to resume repayment of student loans by August 30th. Uh, this is in some ways a compromise. The administration obviously gave in on that request, but they had always said that they intended student loan payments resume by either uh, following a Supreme Court decision around loan forgiveness or June 30th. And because of statutory requirements, that date would then be extended by two months while they implemented the changes necessary to accommodate. So functionally, the administration was looking at really an August 30th deadline at the latest to resume repayment. Uh, so it's not necessarily they've been forced to start earlier than they intended. The bigger upside of that really is that uh, with it now, in, well, assuming the bill passes, and maybe we should have a conversation about that, um, assuming the bill passes, there's a statutory limit. It can't go past August 30th. If for whatever reason the administration decides they would like to extend it further, they can't. They, this would prevent them from doing that. So for all intents and purposes, both from the administration side and, and now as a result of this bill, student loan repayments will resume starting September 1st. Um, but I did, uh, you know, Sarah, there's some other things I know that you were tracking a little bit more closely than I was. You want to talk about those? Yeah, I don't know if tracking is the right word, John, but other things that I noticed in the bill, you know, you're talking about the student loan provisions. I mean, the Republican Congress has been um, worried, right, about um, President Biden's use of executive power. And so there is language in there um, that would require the administration to find cuts for any executive action that would actually cost the federal government money. But then there's also a provision included in there that allows the Office of Management and Budget to waive that requirement if it's in, um, you know, national interest. And so, you know, there's a lot of exceptions to that rule. Um, I think, you know, for our community, one of the things that we've been uh, working on for a while is food insecurity, specifically um, how it impacts our, our students. Um, and this bill, which is one of the things that's causing a lot of heartache, I think, for progressives, um, would expand work requirements for people um, on the SNAP uh, program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or under the Temporary Assistance uh, for needy families. Um, and I think that that is um, really problematic um, as we get into discussing whether or not this will actually pass uh, for some of the progressive Democrats um, in looking at the legislation. And Sarah, and, and Emmanuel, you might be able to jump in on this one too, but I know there's a question mm -hmm. from Eric Canney, uh, who asks, how could the funding for the chips and science and infrastructure bills be affected? Uh, mm -hmm. And Eric notes, these bills represent a lot of funding for higher education. Yeah, I, I would just jump in and I think Emmanuel will have more to say about the appropriations process, but obviously CHIPS and Science um, included some very high authorizations for the federal research agencies. Um, and, you know, I think appropriations are going to be strained um, in the coming years because of these budget caps. So we will likely see some impact um, overall on these um, on the appropriations bills. But Emmanuel, you follow um, appropriations more closely. Just yeah, just, sorry, Emmanuel, just okay. before we jump in, I want to let people know when Sarah mentioned authorizations and appropriations that authorizations essentially is language in bills that say how much the government can spend on a program it doesn't actually say that they will spend that much appropriations is actually the process by which they determine how much actual money will go out to each program. So that's key, key distinction when you talk about that. Thanks, Sorry, John. Sorry, Emmanuel, for interrupting. No, that's okay. I'll just quickly say, um, John, you had mentioned earlier that there's hard caps for FY 2024 and FY 2025. But then after that, there's basically appropriations targets that are not enforceable. So when we're looking at the appropriations process, um, when you break that down, what we're seeing is that $1.59 trillion is going to be the total cap for fiscal year 2024. And one Point six trillion basically uh, will be the cap for FY 2025. But then when you break that down even further, you will see a 3.5% increase for defense from FY 2023 levels. And you will see, John, as you mentioned, pretty much a flat level funding um, going into FY 2024 from FY 2023, which will put us at around 703.7 billion that um, committees will have for the non-defense discretionary to operate in and, and figure out how do we keep the federal government funded and what does that look like. And moving into FY 2025, um, we are going to see around 710 
$1.7 billion. Um, so you do see kind of that 1% increase, John, as you mentioned earlier, um, but, and John, I don't remember, did you talk about the 1% cut if there are not, if the appropriations process hasn't taken place by January 1st, 2024? I, I did not. I mentioned there were enforceable mechanisms, but why don't you spell those <laughs> out? <laughs> okay. Um, so if there's a continuing resolution uh, by January 1st of 2024, then basically we will see a 1% reduction for defense and non-defense spending. And so, as I mentioned earlier, because there will be a 3.5% increase for defense for FY 2024, then that's going to be a pretty drastic cut. For non-defense, because it's gonna pretty much be the same in funding, um, maybe a little smidge lower, it's not gonna be that drastic, but it's pretty much put in place to encourage lawmakers to actually get the appropriations bills through Congress. So I just wanted to add it's, that. It's that threat, especially I think compelling the threat of a much bigger cut to defense. That's mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. people on both sides don't wanna see happen. So it's a it's a good spur towards the members to get these bills passed in time. Um, so then to, to both of you on the FY24 appropriations process, which we've already started, right? What, what does this mean for as they're marking up the bills? Will these budget caps be applied evenly across programs? Will this perhaps say what the 302B allocations are going to be for each committee? What, how is this going to play out? Take it, Emmanuel. Well, yeah, well, I'll just say that it. we will see how it plays out. Um, it, it could be evenly split, but it likely would not be evenly split because obviously members, you know, they're going to prioritize different accounts over other accounts. And, and so depending on what the members' preferences are, of course, with leadership too and how well we have, a, we would have a 302A allocation, but then with the 302B and what that would look like. So it's all up in the air, but we can only continue to advocate and push for as minimal of a negative impact for institutions of higher education and our students as possible in, in moving forward with that. So one thing I think that we can be positive, or one thing that's positive is even though there has been that threat of moving back to the FY 2022 levels and Limit Save Grow Act, and then recently the White House put out a report that cuts could be up to 30%, um, above that 22% initially that we were seeing, we were not necessarily hearing from Republicans who are in prominent leadership roles regarding the appropriations processes on the House side championing that necessarily. You know, they were somewhat silent, which, which gave us hope that maybe they weren't entirely in agreement with a 22% cut, definitely not a 30% cut. And so I think that we can take that uh, to mean that moving forward with funding, maybe it's not as bad as we were predicting. And Sarah, you had alluded to that earlier, that this bill is largely clean, only, only 99 pages. And it, it seems that this is a much better spot than what we thought we would be in right now. And, and we are lucky in that on the appropriations, a lot of the leaders of the committees and subcommittees that impact higher ed know our programs, care about this, have a demonstrated record of supporting uh, programs like Pell Grants and institutional support. So uh, it's a good point, Emmanuel, to raise that they may not be comfortable, uh, even if the cuts are bigger than hoped, maybe sparing or at least lightening the load on, on some of the programs that are important to us. Um, I'd also say Bill Andreessen uh, had what I think is a pretty interesting question. I think, Emmanuel, I'm hoping you can answer because I cannot. Um, what happens to the 1% cut if Congress passes some but not all of the appropriations bills? Well, that's a very good question. Um, from the language, it pretty much just says if there's a continuing resolution, then there will be this 1% cut. I, I would say that if Congress successfully passed some but not all, we can only, we don't know exactly how they're going to move forward with that. Um, so I, I think that that's a good question and it's something that we would want to be on the lookout. But one thing that I will say, because of the makeup of the Republican Party, and you have your, you know, your certain members who gave McCarthy such a hard time and even becoming the speaker, 
Um, I think that the Freedom Caucus members and, and your more conservative members are going to pretty much expect and push for that 1% cut. It's kind of a, a all or nothing sort of thing. I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see something of that nature, but only time will tell, to be honest. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, and clearly, Bill has come up with a question that perhaps uh, the negotiators had not thought through. So uh, perhaps you should have been at the table, Bill. Um, sticking with you, Emmanuel, but changing topics, uh, gainful employment. This is un until the debt ceiling deal coalesced. I think this is probably the issue we heard the most about, talked the most about. Uh, we're seeing the most coverage on and, and you are AC's lead on this. Let people know what they need to know about gainful employment proposed regulations. Yeah, so first and foremost, gainful employment is so much more than just gainful employment. Obviously, the department has a very rigorous unified agenda. And within that, those issues that are actually a part of this notice of proposed rulemaking is, are the ability to benefit, administrative capability, certification procedures, fi uh, financial responsibility, and then gainful employment. <laughs> but gainful employment is you know, the hot topic. And so definitely this is something that originated back in, beginning in 2009, you know, there was, there was the, the, the 2010 GE uh, regulation and then it was amended by the 2014 on, on the Obama administration then rescinded under Trump in 2019, I believe. And now here we are with the Biden administration putting out another proposed gainful employment regulation. So some, some highlights here is that this is not the same as 2014. Um, there are no draft rates that institutions will be able to have. There's not going to be a, a zone period. You know, either you pass or you fail. Um, there will be an opportunity for institutions to appeal that data through subpart G of the regulations, which is your termination uh, procedures that have been a part of regulations for quite some time now. So the department is allowing for that to happen, which we're thankful that there is at least that process uh, because during the negotiated rulemaking sessions, we weren't sure if that was going to be allowed. Um, there will be the ability of, of institutions to look at the list of students who would be a part of these cohorts. And so let's talk about the students, because I think the most important thing is the data, right, and how the data is being calculated. So in the notice of proposed rulemaking, the department defines students as Title IV eligible students. So when you're looking at that and you're determining debt to income ratios and you're determining something that's called an earnings premium, which basically means that if your graduates earnings three years after they graduate are not higher than the earnings of high school graduates um, using data from the U.S. Census Bureau for the age group of 25 to 34, then you basically fail something called your earnings premium. And those are the high school graduates in your state, right? It's state by state levels. Yes, it's, it's in your state. And so in, in thinking about that, in determining these metrics, you're looking at students who are taking on student loans or participating in Title IV um, somehow, some way. And so for programs that may not have any students that are utilizing Title IV at all, then even though now gainful employment is going to be expanding, and I'll get to that in a second, it is still primarily focused on students with Title IV. Uh, loans, grants, whatever the case may be. But let's talk about this expansion. So gainful employment has generally been under subpart Q, uh, <laughs> and now they have created a new subpart to put gainful employment in there, subpart S, but that's me being weedy. Uh, but this <laughs> new financial value transparency piece is what I'm getting to, and it is in this section that gainful employment used to be in. But financial value transparency, this goes back to an announcement that the department had made about the student loan debt forgiveness proposal that's currently at the Supreme Court, right? And that was back in August of 2022. And in that announcement, they talked about looking at programs that have the worst outcomes for students. They used some language like that. And then in January of this year, there was a request for information around low financial value programs. And so this is a continuation and a build on something that we began to hear about back in August of 2022. And so with this financial value transparency, the department is basically requiring every single institution to report on every single program. And 
but what's being reported on every program uh, and that's are, every program not every gainful employment program right? every it, program offered by institutions that's yes every eligible. that's exactly right every single program offered by institutions will have a debt to earnings rate calculated and will have an earnings premium rate calculated but I want to make sure that I'm clear that it is for students with Title IV eligibility. That's mm -hmm. how you determine the debt to rate income ratio. That's how you determine the earnings premium ratio. And it has to be a cohort of 30 or more who have completed over the past two years or over a four year um, cohort period. And so if there are less than 30 students in a two year or four year cohort period, then there are no debt to earnings rates calculations, there are no earnings premium calculations, um, that sort of thing. And so with these new calculations, there is something that gives us a little bit of pause. And there's a section in there uh, called supplemental performance measures. And in that particular section, the secretary would have the ability to look at these debt to earnings rates and the ability to look at the earnings premium along with educational spending, withdrawal rates, licensure pass rates, of course, and basically say, we are going to put your program participation agreement on provisional status because you failed a couple of, you know, these DE rates, earnings premiums, and we're concerned, or we're going to decide to not renew your um, PPA as it is. And so that is a little bit concerning when the secretary would have the ability to basically cut an institution off from Title IV funding through their PPA agreement due to some of these rates. Emmanuel, just for one second, PPA is? Program Participation Agreement. Which is the agreement institutions sign with the Department of Education to follow certain rules that makes them eligible for Title IV. Yep. Um, and so with that, we have questions. Obviously, what that could mean is that institutions would basically submit another eligibility and certification approval report, um, I believe I got that right, back to the department in order to remove those programs that have failed from their PPA and then move forward in that way. But at the same time, it's still unclear entirely, and that is concerning to us. But another thing that becomes concerning is even within um, these, these, these new rates, there are acknowledgements and warnings, obviously they have to be reported. The warnings are not new. Warnings from gainful employment took place in 2014, but there's a new acknowledgement from the financial value transparency that if there is a failing program or if a program could fail, which there's a three-year window, if you have failing rates within two years, two consecutive years, then you fail. So that means that the very first year that an institution may receive a failing debt to income ratio, then they have to send an acknowledgement to their current and prospective students or a warning if it's technically a GE program, a non-degree program um, at public and private nonprofit in institutions or any program at a for-profit institution. And that is an additional step, an additional reporting requirement too, as well. One thing that I want to highlight is for an institution to pass debt to earnings ratios, there is an annual rate and a discretionary rate. And basically a student cannot, if they're paying more than 20% of their discretionary income and their loan payments, then that is going to fail, right? And how um, is a discretionary rate determined? So the discretionary rate is determined based on your median annual uh, loan payment divided by your median annual earnings minus the product of 1.5% times the poverty level. <laughs> that is the equation <laughs> for determining discretionary. Just earnings. as simple as that. Just as simple as that. <laughs> um, and for the annual rate, it's literally your median annual loan payment divided by your median annual earnings. And so that's determining your annual loan um, rate. So using those calculations, if you pass the discretionary, but you fail the annual, you pass, which is good. So you don't have to pass one or the other there, which is very, very good.
<clears throat> right? But with the earnings premium, it's either pass or fail, the earnings premium, and the earnings premium and the debt to um, income or rate, the, the debt to yeah, income ratio, or debt to earnings ratio, they do not have a relationship. So in two of three consecutive years, you can pass one, you can fail the other, right? Um, and if you don't pass in two of those three consecutive years, then you could potentially lose access to your Title IV funding, which then becomes concerning. Um, and so I think that that's really important to point out. Another thing that's important to point out is there are additional reporting requirements too as well within gainful employment. And so institutions have to report on all programs and they will have to report retroactively on those programs by the time the rule goes into effect, which would be July 1st of 2024. So by July 31st of 2024, they will have to report on the second to seventh years for your non-medical and dental programs, a whole list of things about the institution and about the students and also about non-Title IV students too as well. So I think that is important to note because as I started the conversation, I talked about the definition of students that's used in the NPRM being Title IV only, but when it comes to reporting on these programs, which you're reporting on all programs, every single program, not just GE programs, um, there is a, a, a section in there that deals with uh, reporting for non-Title IV students too as well. And I still haven't oh. said everything. But. No, I know there's there's so much in this, Emmanuel, and I think that you provided a really great summary that I think is posted on our website of everything that's in this regulatory package. Um, we did have a couple questions come in while you were speaking. Um, the first is this applies to publics and privates. Again, you you talked about it. It applies to students who are Title IV eligible. Um, and I know we are going to be responding to this enormous regulatory uh, package. What is, uh, what's the timeline for that? They must be giving us a lot of time because this is so complicated, right? Yeah, Sarah, that's a really good question. So we only get 30 days. So by January 20, by June 20th, we have to have our comments in. And actually, we sent a letter requesting for an additional 30 days because there is so much here. Even so far in our conversation, I, I went into some detail about gainful employment. And it sounded like I went into a lot of detail, but it was really only some of the details there. And then the other issue areas I touched on very high level that I touch on those things. So we are working on a substantive comment letter and we do want to address a number of the things in, in greater detail because it will have an impact on students, it will have an impact on institutions of higher education, and we want to make sure we're doing our due diligence. And so 30 days arguably is not enough time to be as substantive as we should be in order to be the best advocates as we should be. Mm -hmm. But that is where we are right now. So we are doing our best to comply. <laughs> We'll keep our fingers crossed that we we hear back from the department that they give us a little more time. Yeah. And, and we are grateful to have you tracking this as closely as you are, Emmanuel. So uh, again, for everybody watching, uh, benefit from Emmanuel's wisdom and expertise, check out the summary he prepared for you, uh, which I think has been dropped into the chat. Um, I'm just going to jump in with one other quick regulatory announcement. And I know, Sarah, you had a couple things you want to touch on, but mm -hmm. um, Title IX, we have been tracking when the Title IX regulations would be released for uh, quite a while. And there was speculation that we would see them in April, then in May, uh, then in June. Uh, the department actually came out and announced last week that no, indeed, October will be when the final Title IX regulations are released. The uh, that will be obviously later than I think some people had expected. The other question will be the timeline for implementation by which you need to come into compliance. Uh, and actually, I'm trying to remember, did they state when institutions would need to be in compliance? What was the 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 window for that as part of the announcing the schedule? Or are they going to wait until they release the regs? Do either of you know? No, it's okay. I, All right. I, yeah. We'll Maybe somebody can drop it in the people. chat. Um, but Sarah, I know there's a couple other things you wanted to touch on. 
Yeah, I was just going to mention um, that uh, the House, uh, two House members last week introduced the closest we've gotten to a comprehensive immigration bill called the Dignity Act. Um, this was introduced by Congresswoman Salazar, a Republican from Florida, and Congresswoman Escobar, a uh, Democrat from Texas. Um, and it's it's of note because it is bipartisan. We don't um, we, we haven't seen large immigration bills uh, with bipartisan support in the last uh, in the last Congress. They were very rare. And this um, this includes the Dream and Promise Act, which previously passed the House, which would provide a pathway to citizenship um, for for qualified DACA recipients and dreamers. It, it would create a new program called the Dignity Program that would um allow uh, undocumented immigrants um, who wish uh, who qualify and wish to register for work authorization the opportunity to get a renewable work authorization and remain in the U.S. Um, with deferred removal. However, um, it would come at a cost of $10,000, and that $10,000 would be put into an American, American Worker Relief Fund, um, and that funding would go for retraining um for um for jobs and um upskilling um and you know i i think that there's a lot of concerns about the cost about the program but i think people are hopeful that this is a start of a conversation and obviously we continue to um ask congress to provide some certainty for our dreamers and for our daca recipients um, especially as we sit here wondering when the Supreme Court may take up the next case around DACA, um, we really need Congress to act. So unclear the pathway for this piece of legislation, but notable since it's bipartisan, and we hope that at least it means that Congress is moving forward and having these conversations. Yeah, uh, a hopeful sign, even if I think expectations are we won't see it move to enactment. But Thank you, Sarah. And Emmanuel, I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but uh, there's been some activity in the House uh, of Impact to Higher Education. You want to tell people about that? Yeah. Um, so on the House side, the committee has been busy and Secretary Cardona has been up for an oversight hearing and the members definitely wanted to get a firm yes that there will be no more extensions of the student loan payment pause, Republican members did at least. And then they've also had Richard Cordray and James Koval up too to talk about a whole number of things, the new IDR plan, the student loan debt forgiveness proposal, section 117, the student loan debt repayment pause, um, and just any other thing you can think of that members definitely Title IX issues, definitely um, transgender athletic sort of issues that a number of members had talked about and brought up. But there has been robust conversations. We're not surprised that we've seen around 11, now more than 11 oversight letters from the committee to the Department of Education um, or just the federal government in general about what they believe to be an overreach. And with the um, Congressional Review Act resolution that was passed by the House, and that's going to the Senate this week, and this, we're hearing that the Senate might take it up to today, Wednesday, today. Uh, <laughs> so it's hard to keep track of the days now. Um, I'm in Washington State, everyone, by the way. So I'm three hours behind and You know, I had 27 hours in my 24 hour day yesterday, which I enjoyed <laughs> take advantage of. Um, so there's a lot of movement happening. And I know that the, the committee is obviously still thinking about the HEA, um, right now, there's been a pivot, obviously, in oversight because of all the things that the department has been doing, but I know that there's still a focus on HA reauthorization and quietly behind the scenes, I know that committee staff is, is working on an HEA reauthorization bill and, and what, what does the majority want to see there and, and how that will take place. So a lots, lots of fun happening in the halls of office. Lots happening. And, and, and one other thing uh, reports this week about short-term Pell and negotiations between committee staff, majority, minority about advancing a bill around uh, Pell for short-term programs. So uh, not just a lot of activity in the hearing space, but as you pointed out, I mean, a lot of it, uh, going on and negotiating behind the scenes that uh, may advance a few issues that we are tracking. 
Uh, we are running right up against the time. I know there's a question, a couple quick questions earlier. Uh, Danny Bounds had asked about the deadline for HERF and ESSR funds. That is June 30th. Uh, it was supposed to be last year. The department extended it. You can ask for an extension for another year, but the department is applying a pretty healthy level of scrutiny as to exactly why you need that extension at this point. So there is the possibility of pushing it beyond that, but you need to have a pretty compelling argument as to why. So uh, I think with that, we are now up against the line. Uh, and we want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank Emmanuel for joining us in your first uh, .edu live appearance. Uh, I think safe to say we'll be seeing you back again that probably very soon. Uh, and thank you all for attending. We hope it was as uh, useful for you and as fun for you as it was for us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. As always, you can check out earlier episodes and subscribe to .edu on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. For show notes and links to the resources mentioned in the episode, you can go to our website at acenet.edu backslash podcast. Well there, please take a short survey to let us know how we're doing. You can also email us at podcast at acenet.edu to give us suggestions on upcoming shows and guests. And finally, a very big thank you to the producers who helped pull this podcast together. Lori Arnston, Audrey Hamilton, Malcolm Moore, Anthony Trueheart, Rebecca Morris, Jack Nicholson, and Fatma Gom. They do an incredible job making this happen and making John Mushtaq and I sound as good as possible. Finally, thank you so much to all of you for listening. <laughs>